Thank you for joining us this afternoon. I'm Kyle Siebrecht, Executive Director of Strength in Numbers, Power and Connection. Welcome to our friends from Miami and all over the state of Florida, and to those from the 36 states across the US. And welcome to our international friends as well. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing you to my longtime friend and colleague, Laura Knott, artist, curator, editor, author, and the founder of Cultureberg.com, a company that organizes exhibitions. Much of Laura's curatorial work has focused on histories of art and artists affiliated with MIT. Her artistic projects have been presented online and in international venues, including the Documenta exhibition. Laura is an alumna of Duke University and she also holds a degree from MIT's Center for Advanced Visual Studies, where she studied environmental art and film and video. Laura will be leading our panel and introducing us to the work of three esteemed women artists in environmental art. One of these, Nancy Valadores, is with us today. Also joining us as a panelist is Sylvia Barcione, chief curator, the Wilsonian FIU, discussing Ultimo, the disturbing and visionary work by Ruth and John Vassos. Following the presentations, there will be a general Q&A session when you may address any of the speakers. For questions, use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and please make uh, sure to address the speaker at the beginning of your question. The panelist may answer you privately during the event, or we will read your question aloud during the Q&A. Uh, this program is being recorded. Now let's begin. Laura? Thank you, Kyle. Um, I'm going to begin by introducing our two guests, and then uh, I'll talk for a little while about uh, a couple of other artists, and then we'll all join each other again toward the end. Um, so first, uh, as Kyle said, welcoming Sylvia Barisiona, who is the ch chief curator at the Wolfsonian Florida International University in Miami Beach, Florida. Sylvia's research focuses primarily on 20th century design and on pre-war Italian architecture. She has organized dozens of exhibitions on these topics. In 2014, Sylvia was a contributing author to the catalog of the Guggenheim Museum exhibition, Italian Futurism, 1909 to 1944, Reconstructing the Universe. The first comprehensive view of Italian futurism ever uh, presented in the United States. And in 2018, Sylvia co-curated the Wolfsonian's first ever exhibition on Art Deco. Sylvia will be our respondent to the work presented today and will also speak briefly about the technologically dystopian book Ultimo by Ruth and John Bassos, which was published in 1930 and is in the collection of the Wolfsonian. So hi, Sylvia, welcome. And we'll be talking again later. <laughs> um, I'd also like to welcome Nancy Valladares, an interdisciplinary artist from Tegucigalpa, Honduras. In addition to working on ecosystems of plant species, Nancy traces ecosystems of political and social power that are embedded both within image making technologies and within the ways that plant species have traveled across the globe. Drawing from the historical entanglements among filmmaking, photography, and colonial consciousness, Nancy works to reconfigure the structures of both storytelling and cultural memory. She holds a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and a Master of Science degree in Art, Culture, and Technology from MIT, which was granted just last year. Nancy's solo exhibition, Botanical Ghosts, is currently on view at the Wiesner Gallery at MIT. And later today, we'll be discussing her project, Mammal Seed Bombs, which she created in 2019 at Sakia, a 28-acre center for art and regenerative agriculture that's located outside of the Palestinian city of Ramallah. So 
hi, Nancy. Nice to see you. And we'll be talking again in just a little while. Okay, so I thought I would start by um, introducing some of the ideas that we'll be thinking through today. Um, and then I'll show you a couple of artists' work and then, then Nancy and I will talk. And then Sylvia. Um, artists have worked in the field of ecological and environmental concerns for many, many years. In fact, it's sort of a, a cyclical um, working through um, those issues. Um, as you'll see in the book that Sylvia presents, it was an issue that was very um, strong in the 1930s. But in the past 20 years, artists' concerns and work within ideas around environmentalism and ecological issues has really, really expanded and become quite a very strong stream within contemporary art. This, of course, reflects the same kinds of um, interests and concerns that are showing up in the literatures of um, the social sciences, showing up in philosophies, and um, showing up in scientific writing as well. So I know that there's a bibliography that came along with the, the presentation today, and I wanted to show you a couple of books from that bibli bibliography. This is one of them, Symbiotic Planet, which is by the evolutionary biologist Lynn Margulis, um, a, a kind of uh, a fundamental study of uh, the issues we'll be talking about today. This was published in the 1990s. And then an important, much more recent book called Matters of Care, Speculative Ethics in More Than Human Worlds by the social theorist and thinker Maria Puch de la Bella Casa. So if you're interested in further exploring these ideas, I urge you to, um, to have a look at those as well. So what I think we're gonna see these artists doing today is proposing alternative worlds and proposing those worlds by challenging what I call, or what many thinkers have called, our habits of thought. We might think of, a, of them as our systems of thinking or the channels in which we normally think. Some might call it the ruts in which we normally think. So these artists are proposing encompassing other systems of belief in addition to or beside the predominant systems of belief that exist and have existed in what we call so-called Western culture, really since the enlightenment. So the belief systems that are surrounding um, science and the scientific method and the belief systems that are surrounding the development of science through engineering and technology being to some extent challenged, but also um, uh, invitations being extended to think about putting alongside those systems of belief, other systems of belief and practice that include, for instance, traditional knowledges, knowledges that arise through the body and knowledge that comes from other species um, besides the human. So this of course raises a question about um, what are we talking about when we're talking about um, the intelligence of other species? And that's a topic that's, that's brought up in the work of, of a couple of these artists that we'll be talking about today. These artists also highlight the complexity of interactions among species. Uh, that's a topic that Lynn Margulis also explores, but they're really thinking about, not about trees of life and defining um, uh, taxonomies of life, but really thinking about uh, sophisticated, complicated, and uh, 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 interacting um, relationships among species. Um, I think it's important too to highlight that there's a sense of urgency in the work that we're going to be looking at today. The urgency based on um, on environmental and, and ecological concerns. But the urgency that we're looking at today really has to do with the urgency of nurturing relationships among humans and other species. And the, the larger frame of that urgency has to do with seeing the human species, not as an observer of nature and not as standing outside of nature, not as even acting upon nature but seeing the human as a species as being a part of nature or being indelibly deeply embedded within nature. So 
I, this is my pet peeve of the year, you know, people say, oh, well, you're cooped up in your house, go out and walk in nature. Well, the next time someone tells you to do that, well, of course you wanna go outside and you wanna experience that, but you can also answer, I am nature. I don't have to go out to experience nature. Nature is here with me as well. Okay, so these kind of complicated ideas about thinking about how humans react with others, act with other species and how humans take a role in nature. Well, what is the role of artists in thinking about and working with these kinds of issues? Another way of saying that is really a big question, which is a question of what can art do? We know art can entertain, art can soothe, but what else can art do? And especially when art is, is um, tackling, grappling with important issues of the day. Um, that's a question that's been uh, explored by many, many thinkers throughout the centuries. One of those thinkers was the founder of the Center for Advanced Visual Studies, his name was Yuri Kapish. Um, and he described artists as being what he called early warning systems for their society. Um, Kepish made this, this analogy in the post-World War II period. So it, you know, it makes sense really that he would use a, a, an analogy that comes from the military industrial complex of artists being as sort of like radar, um, uh, looking over the horizon to what dangers might come next. But I would like to propose another analogy today. And that analogy is a biological one. Thinking of artists not as, um, early warning systems, but as artists being the people in our society who have their antennae out. And by antennae, I don't mean signal towers, and I don't even mean dishes that are um, focused on satellites. I mean this kind of antennae, their, their feelers. Artists who are, who are bringing to their work the exquisite sensoria that have been developed in their professional practice and in their professional training and using the, that sensorium to, um, to speak to audiences about issues of care and concern. Before I jump into an individual artist's work, I wanna say one more thing about these artists that is maybe counterintuitive. I think it's, um, it's become sort of accepted that when, um, when people talk about um, environmental issues and concerns, they often uh, take a kind of a doom laden um, uh, attitude. What I, one of the things that I really love about the work that we're gonna look at today is that all of these artists are to my thinking, they are deeply optimistic. So in the ways that they are acknowledging the powers, the advances, the systems of science and technology. And all of these artists, by the way, have had affiliations with MIT and all of them have worked in, in technology with technological means. They are at the same time proposing that we begin to value, to I suppose respect and to act upon the possibility that other ways of knowing that derive from traditional knowledge, that derive from knowledge of the body, and that derive from knowledge of other species might be of interest to us as we try to understand what kind of world do we want to live in and how will we get there. Okay, so artists turning toward environmental concerns, very strong over the last 20 years. Artists reflecting what's going on in the literature of the social sciences and in contemporary philosophy. Artists projecting alternative futures and doing that by opening to the possibility that there are futures that may be guided by forms of knowledge that are not the currently predominant forms of knowledge. Artists highlighting the complexity of relationships among species. Artists thinking about what does intelligence mean? What does it mean to be to understand intelligence? And are there intelligences that we simply cannot understand? Artists seeing humans as part of nature. And artists taking a role, which I'm describing as being the antennae of our society. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen now.
this first image is by the artist Riga Luther. Uh, she's a Danish artist, has worked extensively in audio and video. And this is from uh, an exhibition at the 2016 Sao Paulo Biennial called Overspill Universal Map. This was one of four quite large panels. It, this was measured in feet. It's something like 13 feet by seven feet tall. Um, and the four panels uh, were made of individual tiles that were adhered to the wall. And they, they illustrated in this sort of cartoon drawing style that Riga employs the four global commons that were defined uh, by the United Nations, the global commons um, being the areas in, the, in our neighborhood that are uh, supposedly held in common for all species on the planet. And they are outer space, Antarctica, um, the atmosphere, and the high seas. The image that you're seeing here is the high seas, and it's kind of an image that you might expect when an artist begins to think about environmental concerns. There are several at the bottom, you can see several different kinds of, um, of uh, coral and seaweed, uh, polyps and so on at the left, toward the top, a turtle, there are whales, there are little fishes and so on. And then you can see these interactions of humans with with the environment of the high seas that include things like sand dredging, um, oil drilling, the plastic gyres in the oceans and so on. And along the edges, um, the, the sea edges, you can see in some places some spills that are coming um, that, that are related to, to human activity, including at the top left, this rust colored spill that is depicting the worst um, kind of rapid disaster that ever has ever happened in Brazil, which was a, two, a 2015 spill of millions and millions of toxic tailings from an iron ore operate an iron mining operation. So here we see in this part of Riga's installation, kind of what we might expect of an, an illustration of an artist who is in some ways um, highlighting and I would say even condemning human action. But that wasn't the whole exhibition. This is a, a kind of an installation view. You can see in the background the uh, Antarctica um, tiles and, and their, their size. And then in the front, this long, long object that is lying down on this concrete bench is a sculpture of the Prototaxites fossil. Prototaxites was a fungal body that existed 400 million years ago at a time when all of the other fungi in the known in the world at the time were quite small and were hugging the ground. Prototaxites, this is a, a about 18 feet, this model is about 18 feet long. It's a one-to-one -one model. So Prototaxites is believed to have grown to its great size um, because it was not a single organism, because it was a fungus that was cooperating with uh, either photosynthesizing bodies or with bacteria. And that because of this cooperative action, Prototaxites was able to grow to this enormous size that none of the other kind of single organisms of fungi were able to do at the time. So I think what we're seeing here in, Riga's, in this work by Riga Luther is she's giving us this view, this sort of you know, cartoon drawing view of the world as we generally think of it. And then she's showing, she's pointing another direction. She's not being explicit about it. She's making this giant fossil sculpture and leaving a hint with that sculpture. And I think the hint is what happens? What happens if species agree to work together, if species act in symbiotic, in a symbiotic manner? Okay, so that's Rico Luther. And then I'd like to turn toward Pia Lindman, another artist who has MIT affiliations. She graduated from the same program that Nancy graduated from at MIT. Um, and this is a work called Nose, Ears, Eyes, also at the Sao Paulo Biennial, also in 2016. This is a mud hut that Pia designed and the biennial employed local artisans to build the hut for her. If you look carefully at this image, you'll see that it, the hut has a snout 
the snout is running out the window of the exhibition space and into the tree outside. So the exhibition is called Nose, Ears, Eyes. And the implication of this mud hut running to the outside is that the hut itself is sniffing, that the hut itself is communicating, is sensing the outside world and is bringing the outside world into the interior of this hand-built mud hut. Pia, by the way, an artist who has worked extensively with robots. Here's the interior of the hut. Growing plants. Um, uh, uh, this is sort of typical of several of Pia's projects. She she has live plants in this in the spaces that she designs. Plants that are breathing, inhaling, exhaling, the light coming from the exterior into the hut, and what appears to be an empty space. But the space was enlivened. Um, Pia offered. Uh, the visitors of the um, to the biennial, the opportunity to sign up to have um, bodywork sessions with Pia. The bodywork sessions were they're called Kalevala bone setting. They're founded on this uh, centuries old technique of working with the body, the healer and the the heal e being um, communicating with each other while the body is manipulated in order to heighten the awareness of the, both the, the person who is um, practicing the, the healing and the person who's receiving the healing to heighten their awareness of what Pia calls subsensorial experiences. So I wanna just read you one sentence that, um, that Pia describes this work. She says, our senses, if allowed, might find ways to be in dialogue with molecular infinitesimal subsensorial events that often remain outside or beyond our normal registry of sensory signaling. Okay, so I think what's happening in both of these artists' work is first we have Rika Luther who is you know, depicting humans' relationships to other species and the damage that we can, can see. But at the same time, she is pointing, she's pointing. What about, look over here. What about this prototaxites fossil? What did it know? What was its intelligence? And here we have Pia Lindman, who is speculating in the same way that Maria Puch de la Bella Casa is talking about speculative ethics. Pia Lindman is speculating that the material of the hut itself is sensing the outside that it's bringing its, those sensory modalities into the interior of the hut where two humans at a time, just two people at a time in an exhibition that millions of people or at least hundreds of thousands of people would have, have visited, um, two people at a time are having this communication in which they are trying to sense what Pia describes as the subsensorial. So I think what we're looking at here is artists who no technology, artists who work with technology, artists who accept and in some ways I think celebrate the, the um, powers and, and the uh, accomplishments of technology. But after many years of being in the field, after many years of working with robots and working with audio and video, they are now turning toward traditional knowledges, they're turning toward ancient beings, they're turning toward um, the materiality of earth. And by earth, I mean lowercase e and capital E earth. Which I think brings us then to Nancy's work. Um, and Nancy, I have two slides of your work that I want to show. And I, um, I'll just describe them briefly. I mean, very briefly. And then let's talk about what what I think you're up to and what you, what you really are up to. <laughs> okay, so this is Nancy's work, um, Mammal Seed Bomb, um, which is part of a project called Soil is a Planetary Word. And we're gonna talk about the title. Um, and I wanna show you the next slide right away. This is the Mammal Seed Bomb in, um, in bloom or, or in, in flower. So I think the, um, 
there's several important parts of this project that have to do with how um, seeds travel across the world, but also I think a, a kind of thread through Nancy's work is to understand what do seeds know? What can we learn from the knowledge uh, that seeds capture inside of themselves? So Nancy, are you, your mic is on? Yes, hi. Hey. Um, mm -hmm. So first, I want to just ask about the title of the of the whole series. Um, Soil is a planetary word. So if you could just say something about that. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Laura. It's really good to see you again. You. Um, and uh, and uh, yeah, thank you so much so much for inviting me to you know talk a little bit about my work. Um, and you know this particular piece was a you know like you mentioned just a small chapter in like a larger series that was basically dealing with um, you know the the top topics around you know the liveliness and the sort of like um, basically subjectivities you know that exist within you know soil itself like as a you know as a, a living breathing thing. Um, entity and being. Um, and so the title is um, sort of like an, maybe a nod, I think, to, um, you know, this more and more common thinking almost like, I don't, you know, uh, want to only credit uh, Bruno Latour, but, you know, this kind of Latourian notion of um, the planetary and what are the ways in which we, um, you know, are entering a time where we need to rethink and reconsider what what is our notion, what are our notions of the planetary, because we're we're no longer able to exist purely in one you know like geographic area, um, you know, and uh, uh, soil is like I think an evidence of that for me, um, because you know despite the fact that it's a highly regulated and controlled you know substance. Um, and you know, like there's always attempts to monitor its migration. It's incredibly mobile and you know able to migrate. And so, I, um, you know, this kind of like perpetual mingling that happens between soil, you know, like bodies or human and non-human, um, is is all kind of embedded in that in that title and notion. Mm -hmm. I was just at a conference, and I say at in quotes, a conference yesterday um, about urban farming and. Uh, one of the things that amazed me was how much soil is being moved around to create urban farms. Uh, you know, it, 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 you're right. It is highly regular. The motion of soil is highly regulated, and it's something actually that that in a slightly different um, way, uh, Rika Luther is involved in. Her latest project has to do with sand dredging and um, how you know sand being used to to make concrete. Um, can you can you say a little bit more too about the um, about the the Sakia site and also about um, you you talk in your work about taxonomy mm -hmm. and how um, taxonomy I, I, I think I have this right um, is reflecting um, uh, colonization and the travel of of um, of animal species around, or, or plant species around the, the planet. So how does that relate to the site itself, which as I said, is in Ramallah? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so it's, um, it's something that's like not maybe very well known is uh, the fact that in my home country, Honduras, uh, I was uh, born and raised there, um, but there is a really large uh, Palestinian population there. And, um, you know, it's like a wave of, uh, you know, uh, migrants, refugees, you know, who kind of like came in in the 20th century um, for, you know, like for, for various reasons, uh, largely had to do with sort of like political conditions um, and occupation, of course. And so um, there is like this, this kind of like ongoing, you know, kind of exchange and intermingling that is happening, uh, you know, between uh, the Palestinian diaspora in Central America and, um, you know, a sort of, uh, you know, Central American kind of like cultural landscape. Um, but uh, something that is, that was like really particularly interesting to me was that like alongside, um, you know, these uh, cultural exchanges, there was also um, botanical and, you know, um, uh, 
uh, botanical knowledge that was also kind of came, you know, kind of came, um, you know, with this kind of, uh, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, ongoing kind of like migration and exchange. Um, and I was very interested in this kind of crossing, I think, of alterities that was happening, um, but also the very complicated uh, relationships that, um, you know, like, uh, you know, happen between Hondurans um, and, you know, the, you know, local Palestinian diaspora, ethnic tensions are like kind of, mm -hmm. um, you know, very, very clear. Um, and so for me, um, I was following the story of a, you know, Palestinian uh, uh, activist of Palestinian descent who was murdered. Her name was Jeanette Kawas. Um, and this uh, happened in, I believe, 1993, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and I was really interested in her story and was able to kind of trace uh, some of her relatives to um, a place that was like really close to there, um, to, to Sakya. And um, I realized that there uh, is a deep connection between, you know, this environmental violence um, and occupation and, um, you know, violence that occurs also, you know, in towards the soil itself um, as an, you know, organism. Um, as you know, people extract, you know, not only extract from it, but, um, you know, uh, target the soil itself um, as a way of, um, you know, continuing sort, sort of these acts of dispossession and um, control and occupation. And so a lot of these things were kind of crossing um, at the time while I was working on the site. And um, in terms of, uh, you know, my previous work, which has to do with like these kind of uh, plant exchanges and transportation that happened um, in the, you know, uh, 17th and 18th century, um, you know, it's very much this notion of uh, my non-human migration that I think is a really uh, interesting site, I think, to, you know, critique um, what our notions of territory are, what our notions of, um, you know, who is or who is not doesn't get to be you know, uh, a migrant refugee who is, you know, considered, uh, you know, um, an occupant, you know, an occupant, an occupant who is, you know, performing the labor of colonization and who is perpetuating, you know, these kind of like violences, which as someone who is currently living, um, you know, in, you know, Massachusetts, uh, you know, I am aware of, you know, this, also crossing, even though I am, you know, like someone who migrated here as part of a diaspora and also, you know, participating in a kind of um, ongoing occupation of indigenous lands. And so I am very interested in these kind of crossings um, and complicated sites to inhabit, I think, um, as an artist and as a thinker and writer. So I think there, this is like all the work we've talked about today, this is really multi-layered work mm -hmm. um, with, you know, it has these important political and historical ties, and it also has these important ecological ties. That, and even in this work, Mamul Sibam, it relates to cooking. The Mamul is a cookie, a yeah. cookie, the shape of a cookie. Correct. Um, and these are, these are nitrogen um, fixing plants, mm -hmm. seeds that are planted here. So when they, when they grow their roots down into the soil, they'll be enriching the soil. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I just want to tell our audience that I'm not showing I, any of your lovely videos today because I'm so tired of watching videos be so terrible and latent on, on Zoom. But I would encourage everyone to, to go look, especially at Density of Breath, which is on your beautiful website. Thank and you. because in Density of Breath, I think you're really bringing forward the idea that seeds themselves have knowledge. Yeah, correct. And that's a, you know, that's a... Um, I, I think it's a, it, it's an important um, concept to kind of hang on to as we tie everybody's work together today. Mm -hmm. Okay, so thank you, Nancy. I'm gonna talk you. just for a couple of minutes and then we're gonna to turn to Sylvia. Um, okay, so I, I think what's happening here again is that these artists are thinking besides science, beside, I mean, be, alongside scientific ideation to include other forms of knowledge in how we understand the world. They are engaging with the earth 
as it is. And Nancy just brought up Bruno Latour, which is funny because I was thinking about mentioning him here now. Um, I went to a, a lecture that Latour gave a few years ago when he was talking about um, uh, abandonment of the planet Earth. And he, he said essentially that he believes that Americans have already abandoned the planet, that the richest will be the first to leave. And um, it, he was talking about the condition of understanding how to, how to live when um, the, the ecological um, background substance and knowledge that we have had for since we um, evolved um, is endangered. Um, his warning, I think it was implied, his warning was really that the, the impulse toward abandonment of the planet, which is an impulse that is based to my mind, entirely in the thrust of, um, of engineering and technology that that, that that you know the idea of solving a difficult problem, an interesting difficult problem that that, that, that impulse is likely to create um, uh, extremes of inequality among the left and the left behind um, that make today's extremes of inequality look like a walk in the park. So I admit in all of this work and in every time, everything that I think about when I think about art, I place the bar very high. I want something from art. And what I want from art is work that encourages me. I want work that inspires me. I want work that empowers me, that gives me by encourage, I mean, work that gives me courage. And I see that in all of these artists work. They're, they're working with the materials of mud, of, of clay, um, of soil, and they're using those materials to think, is there another way to think about um, our present and subsequently, of course, our future? I don't think that it's the job of art to be useful. I don't think art has to be useful at all, but I do think that it's the job of art to address the time in which it is being made. And what I see in these artists is um, people who are um, thinking, they're thinking beyond doom scrolling, they're thinking beyond blame, and they're thinking into how do we begin to understand the human species in a much broader and a much uh, in a, a concept that has much more depth than the kind of surface conflict that we can see now? Um, I think essentially the question that they're asking is if another world is possible, what do we want it to be? And how can we participate? in its making. Okay, um, Sylvia is gonna talk about escaping um, the earth actually um, in this uh, book called Ultimo. And Sylvia, I'll turn it over to you and then I'll be back in 10 minutes and we'll do um, questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you, Laura, and yeah. thank you. Uh, so we we go back to 19 years ago, since uh, um, Laura asked me to, to choose uh, an object from the Wilsonian collection. And as you probably know, the collection, uh, the, the range of the Wilsonian collection is from 1850 to 1950. So um, I, I thought to propose uh, uh, the work of uh, a couple, a designer and a writer. Uh, John and Ruth uh, Vassos, uh, and uh, I was I looked for a picture of them, and the only picture I found was uh, this one showing the playful uh, uh, nature of these uh, two characters, who are uh, really complementary in uh, to each other in their work. Um, <clears throat> John Vassos has been rediscovered in uh, the last decades because when they opened the archives of RCA. He was uh, the, uh, the consultant for the design of uh, portable radios and um, 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 TVs and um, phonographs uh, since the 1933 up to the 1960s. And uh, very helpful to, to know more about uh, his work is the, is the um, book by Daniel Shapiro, John Vassos Industrial Design for Modern Life. 
um, he, uh, he and uh, Ruth uh, met in New York in 1921 at a party at the Chelsea Hotel and uh, they got married two years later and uh, they lived uh, like uh, uh, together until uh, her death in 1965. She was uh, uh, five years older and um, she, she was a fashion writer and a journalist um, and even a, a stylist for, uh, um, for department stores in New York and she supported modern design. Uh, <clears throat> so when, uh, uh, when they met, they, um, uh, um, John Vassos was already an illustrator, both for, both, both for uh, commercial advertisement and uh, for uh, uh, books. He started, he um, had illustrated a new edition of uh, Oscar Wilde, um, Salome. Uh, but in 1929, he published his first book um, together with Ruth. Ruth was the writer and he was the um, illustrator. They, I wanted to show you the covers because they are uh, like we have them in the collection and they are masterpieces of uh, Art Deco, uh, American Art Deco of the period. Uh, Contempo is the, the first one, is a book of uh, social criticism and uh, with this uh, du uh, dual approach towards, uh, uh, <clears throat> towards the, the machine because uh, nat naturally there is a fascination uh, in, uh, for uh, in designers of this period for uh, the machine, uh, but um, uh, the, uh, also um, being aware of the danger uh, of, uh, of it, of uh, technology. And um, um, uh, Contemporary presents uh, uh, cities which are uh, dis uh, disfigured by traffic, uh, which pours out uh, uh, smoke uh, to, uh, into uh, our lungs. So this, uh, uh, this vision, um, like a, always a critical vision about uh, the, the future can be seen also in uh, a Phobia, which is uh, written by John Vassos uh, uh, without uh, Ruth, and it's uh, dedicated to his uh, friend, the psychiatrist, uh, Harry Sack Sullivan, and uh, uh, conveys the, the, the danger of uh, urban alienation. So the, the, the theme is always uh, the, uh, very recurrent in, uh, in his uh, books, uh, in their books. And uh, Humanities uh, in 1935 is uh, uh, like uh, shows uh, the, uh, the condition uh, of uh, like humanity in, uh, in, um, during the post, uh, the, the, the depression uh, showing really the contrast between uh, wealth and, uh, and poverty with very strong uh, images. Uh, but let's talk about uh, Ultimo. Uh, Ultimo is, um, uh, <clears throat> is the book that uh, uh, is like a visionary uh, uh, science fiction book uh, that represents, uh, um, like deals with the, the um, danger of a uh, climatic catastrophe. Uh, the, um, a narrator tells uh, the story of a world uh, after a, um, the ice, an ice age, and uh, <clears throat> it's uh, it's like uh, narrated in first person, uh, and is uh, it starts with a like a um, debate on uh, um, which was very um, current at the time about uh, density and height in the city. Uh, John and Ruth Vassos uh, uh, lived on the um, twenty-first uh, um, uh, floor of a, a skyscraper, and they have this vision of the city growing. And uh, the um, the first image of the book shows a, a, a stylized uh, Empire State Building um, surrounded by uh, um, dirigibles and uh, uh, with these uh, very dark. Uh, um, background showing uh, like the, um, the lack of uh, light given by this, uh, uh, the density and this uh, uh, crazy um, uh, urban uh, uh, growth without uh, planning. So that's uh, uh, what uh, worries uh, both Ruth and, uh, um, and um, John. Uh, the representation of this uh, uh, ice uh, age, which is very uh, claustrophobic, bo both in the um, illustration and in the description, uh, this uh, ocean liner uh, 
uh, like the myth of the 1930s uh, stuck in a uh, ice of a, uh, in a um, uh, ice sea uh, where, uh, when uh, dirigible uh, even then can't uh, uh, save uh, the, um, uh, the the travelers of this uh, um, a ship which uh, like uh, is frozen and uh, uh, is a very like dramatic uh, start of uh, uh, this population which is frozen inside uh, uh, the the ship and uh, and the world uh, which is populated is, uh, is an underworld uh, the um, uh, the surface uh, is not uh, uh, habitated anymore and uh, um, like hum uh, humans uh, are forced to live in a uh, under the um, uh, under the the earth <clears throat> and uh, this is the representation um of the of the world uh, uh, underneath uh, um of the underworld uh, with uh, this uh, um beautiful uh, um, streamlined architecture naturally um, john vassus is inspired by uh, the this the shapes the streamlined shapes of uh, trains and uh, airplanes uh, um of the uh, of the period uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's still a very, um, in a way, the, the use of this palette of uh, gray and uh, black and white uh, uh, gives uh, an idea of a dreary city where people are forced uh, to live without light. And this is a comparison between uh, the, um, an illustration and the real uh, um, gouache, which is in uh, the collection. Um, so in this world, which is, uh, um, populated by uh, these kind of bats they are the only um, animal species still uh, um, in the in the earth and um, and in uh, even in this uh, very dreary um, world where uh, people uh, like this the narrator is uh, is trapped uh, there is a hope a final hope because uh, uh, is um, able to escape to another planet uh, through this uh, ro rocket. This is the final image of the book with this uh, rocket going to another planet and uh, giving uh, like in uh, a kind of uh, hope in this, uh, this, uh, this utopian uh, world. Um, <clears throat> I think it's, uh, uh, I thought uh, um, thinking about uh, Ultimo uh, immediately of Metropolis, which is a book, we don't have it in the collection, but it's uh, such a uh, world uh, famous uh, uh, book and um, film. Uh, Metropolis was written in 1926 and uh, the, the author is uh, Thea von Arbo. So again, it was a, um, the film, uh, the sub subsequent film was a collaboration between uh, Fritz Lang and uh, uh, Thea von Arbo. And uh, uh, again, uh, there is a, a kind of uh, um, sim uh, similarity uh, with uh, Ultimo. Uh, it's more uh, a struggle, it's more uh, like a class struggle in this case, uh, but uh, again, uh, the contrast between uh, uh, these uh, kind of uh, um, uh, skyscraper landscape uh, with bridges and uh, airplanes, uh, very dense, uh, where the uh, upper class lives, where the planners of the city live, and the, the world uh, underground, uh, where the work uh, the workers live, <clears throat> and um, I think it's uh, there is a, a kind of similarity in this uh, idea of the <clears throat> of the uh, of this under uh, underground world, uh, <clears throat> where even technology um, where te uh, technology has uh, reached such a uh, strong uh, uh, level with this uh, uh, um, assembly. Um, uh, these um, like mechanized the work, uh, but when they work, uh, but then when the workers rebel, uh, rebel, a, a flood uh, um, will uh, uh, will completely like uh, um, destroy the underworld city. So uh, there is a kind of um, similarity, and uh, <clears throat> um, I think that. Uh, um, I don't know if it's uh, Laura. What uh, if you want to intervene somehow? Um, but uh, I think it's very interesting for me. This um, 
this vision, this dystopian, this dystopia at the time, uh, because uh, in the reality, uh, artists and designers in these in those years were really fascinated by the machine. There was a uh, a kind of optimism, uh, both in, uh, in, con in consumerism, in the research of uh, new materials, uh, uh, which uh, without thinking of the danger they could uh, cause. And so I think it's, uh, it's interesting, this uh, dual attitude of also um, from uh, uh, John and uh, Ruth Vassos, uh, in a way, uh, part of the, of the commercial world, the designers and uh, promoters of this uh, world, but in the same time, understanding uh, like the, the danger of, uh, of technology and, uh, if, uh, and of like how um, uh, you, humans uh, could uh, not be able to, um, to stop it. I, uh, I think too, though, at the, you know, at the end of Ultimo, there is the solution is to get on the rocket and leave into mm -hmm. the unknown. So, you know, there's, there's still this, um, you know, I think optimism that, that yeah. the, the same kinds of solutions can can solve problems. There was a, a question in the, I just looked at the questions and a question about something I said about the uselessness of art and how I don't expect art, I don't think art has to be useful. I I think that goes to what we're talking about now, which is that, that um, what I'm, I think what I'm trying to say is that, uh, that even the idea of, um, let me think about this a little bit, that, the, that to sort of back ourselves into always thinking about what is the solution for a problem um, so narrows our way of thinking of what the problem may be. So for instance, if the, you know, the, Vasos or, the Vasoses are writing this book in 1930 when they're questioning the, the um, the kind of uh, uh, consequences of technological developments, especially in urbanism. But then the solution at the end of the book is, which I think they're probably ambivalent about, is that the, the protagonist will leave on the rocket and hope to hope for a better world. So I, I think that, you know, this question about Usefulness is really more of a question about opening up to thinking about the idea of solutions themselves that maybe we're just asking the wrong questions. So um, uh, I don't know, that's just a, it's just a kind of a vague glimmer that I have about um, the possibility that, that uh, the kinds of art that we're looking at today and the kinds of ambivalence that I think the Vassalists were we're expressing, um, you know, is perhaps because uh, we typically are asking questions that are just simply too small, questions that are simply too limited, and they're limited because we have habits of thought or channels of thinking or ruts or you know however we want to describe them, and you know we're being encouraged by these artists, I think, to to open up to new kinds of questions. So, thank you, Sylvie. That was great. I. I, I got a copy of the book myself that was from a library and um, it had stamps all over it. Every single image has a stamp oh, really? um, Yeah, for the library. So it was really kind of sad. So it's nice to see the images without the stamp from the library. So I think we're gonna turn now to questions and answers and um, uh, Zuri, I think will lead us in the questions. Is that right? Um, I'll start off with a question for Nancy. We received one for you. Um, so it says, I am an art and environmental sustainability enthusiast. I love your work. My question is, what were the first thought process, processes and action steps in curating this on-site work with such multi-layers of meaning? How did you begin linking, deciding, and then designing a piece that best portrays your message? Uh Thank you. Uh, thank you for that question. <laughs> um, I uh, will say that the, the, you know, that particular piece was a response, a direct response to the site. Um, it 
was very intuitive and it wasn't until later when I was doing uh, research for um, a film and you know my thesis that I realized a lot of the connections that were emerging um, but it, it happened much later but I think um, research and practice for me are very much connected and so um, all these kind of layers uh, you know they, they were already there I didn't really have to um, do much except just kind of be there and listen and observe uh and uh yeah that, that I would say that's <laughs> thank you Nancy mm -hmm. um Laura I was wondering if you can expand a little bit more on your statement that man has already abandoned the planet earth oh you mentioned I, earlier. I was I was paraphrasing Bruno Latour um who was his his speculation was that Americans have already abandoned, like psychological Americans have already psychologically abandoned the planet, um, and I think you know we're seeing it every day in the news of um, you know the various commercial efforts that are being made to uh, toward exploration. I I have you know my background is in our science and technology too, and I have to I have to confess to extremely mixed feelings about the will and the impetus to explore other worlds. I, I used to argue with my father about this all the time because he, he always said, you know, we need to be solving our problems here. And I was putting up posters of Saturn above the fireplace. So, you know, it's a, I, I understand the impulse, but I, my concern, I think, is that, um, that the, 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 repetition of abandonment of land or in this case of a planet is a it's an ongoing issue that's been happening for for centuries that you know land gets played out as agricultural land and then you know it's just sort of abandoned and, and you move on to the next thing and you know as as nancy was pointing out land in the form of soil and and lowercase earth is often used as a um uh, you know, it's, it's battle, it can be a battleground. So I, uh, I was paraphrasing Bruno Latour saying abandons have already uh, left earth psychologically. Um, but it's, you know, it's an idea that I think has, has quite a lot of currency if you're following the, the news of, you know, discovery and excitement or the excitement around the most recent launches or attempted launches. Thank you, Laura. And kind of also following up with that, um, you also spoke about how artists are complicating our thinking about environmental issues. Can you give an example of how scientific thinking is reflecting those complications too? Well, I can, I can talk a little bit about um, taxonomies in botany um, what's happening now, you know, the taxonomies of botany were, they used to be derived on, based on, um, on the physical characteristics of plants and their, their, and taxonomies were kind of fitting like with like based on, on physical characteristics and time of bloom and so on. What's happening now in the taxonomies of botany is that, um, the, the, uh, the chromosomal material of plants is being investigated um, to, to make genetic, or the genetics of plants are being investigated to make genetic um, uh, bases for, uh, for taxonomies. What's not being uh, challenged, I suppose, is the idea of taxonomy itself, which is always, of course, it's, you know, it's like, a, it would be foolish to say taxonomy is useless. We, if there are large um, bodies of knowledge, we need ways to organize it. But it's very easy to become um, convinced that whatever current form of, uh, of scientific knowledge or taxonomy, um, whatever the current form is, is the final form. When in fact, the, the process of science, the history of science and the the kind of influence of science throughout the world is that it is changing. And um, 
I, I don't know, I had, a, I had a discussion with a botany teacher not too long ago about, um, about being careful not to think that just because we have new information about how to classify plants that we have all of the information about how to classify plants. Thank so that's you. one example. <laughs> okay, thank you. We have a great question that came in and this one's for Nancy. Um, it, it says, I am part of the African and Middle East diaspora, um, diaspora and I was wondering if you have any thoughts about the behavioral patterns of people who emigrate and seeds. Do you think our behaviors reflect that of seeds that have been transplanted to a different area? Um, that's a, yeah, that's a really, really good question. And, um, you know, something that I kind of um, uh, struggled with at the beginning when I first started, uh, you know, to do research into plant migration. And uh, I mean, first I'm going to admit to my hesitation at making that, like that, kind of meta metaphor because I I do think that there's a, a, um, a way that's really easy to uh, kind of anthropomorphize, you know, like, you know, the the plant subjectivities, you know, like it's our attempt at like, I think uh, maybe projecting our human experience, human consciousness into that of, um, you know, of other beings. Um, and so for me, I, 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 I hesitate make, to make that direct, kind of metaphor and, and yet I, I believe that um, non-human migration, you know, or specifically plant migration and seeds themselves often will migrate with humans and their processes that happen simultaneously. I think, um, you know, oftentimes, uh, you know, we, we can, people talk about the uh, Colombian exchange, the problematically named uh, kind of like explosion that happened when uh, the so-called, you know, new world, um, and you know, there was like this kind of exchange of, of plant matter that happened, um, you know, through colonial net networks. And so, um, I do I think that there's a correlation in, in behavior, not necessarily, but I do think that as humans, we we tend to bring things from home when we move from one place to another. And seeds is one of those one of those things where, you know, you you, you know, it's it's a way of uh, I think it, it, it's both perhaps a way of um, controlling the environments the, and, and, you know, attempting at controlling environments that we do not know, if that makes sense, or, you know, creating some kind of ownership or dominion, you know, by, you know, manipulating the, the ecosystems that we live in. Um, but it's, but I also believe it has to do with um, the kind of, you know, affect of migration, which oftentimes has to do a lot with uh, nostalgia and, you know, desire for the things that we know and the places we've been to, we've lived in, uh, and, you know, longing for home. Um, so I, I think that those things are kind of coalescing in a way that mm -hmm. is very complex, but still, um, I, feel, I feel like those are things that happen in tandem and they're, they're, they're part of, yeah, they're, you know, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, I, can I just add one thing to what Nancy said? I think that I agree with the hesitancy to make this kind of direct um, anthropomorphization of plant matter or any other species, even of you know the something like the Prototaxides fossil. But especially for plants at this moment in time, I think it's it's important to be careful about anthropomorphizing other species. The, um, I had a kind of uh, eye-opening and somewhat horrifying discussion with someone about um, during, a, a, you know, one of many migration um, crises, quote unquote, that was happening in the news. And, and I, I happened to be talking about native plant species mm -hmm. and realized very quickly that this person was taking what people in the botanical world talk about when they talk about the, the uh, kind of quote happiness unquote of native plants within their own environment and anthropomorphizing that to, um, to uh, human migrants on the move for a, very, for a very wide variety of reasons. So it's a, 
it's unhelpful, I think, to anthropomorphize other species, but it can all, it also has its kind of political consequences to do that. And it's just something to kind of be aware of and, and you know, be uh, leery about, I would say. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Laura. Um, Sylvia, we really love the book. We think it's incredible. Even uh, one of our attendees, Sienna, thought that the book was incredible and we thank you so much for sharing it. And one question that we have for you is, um, do you see other examples in the Wilsonian's collections in which designers are questioning the future techno technological development or the role of technology in human futures? Uh, <clears throat> I have to say that uh, uh, like Vassos, John Vassos and Ruth Vassos book are uh, um, are quite an exception because if I think uh, of uh, books from the same period, for example, I showed a picture, I even forgot to mention it, the picture of uh, Hugh Ferris, uh, The Metropolis of Tomorrow, where there are these yes, the kind of visionary um, representations uh, of, of, um, of the future metropolis without uh, so much concern about, uh, yes, the density uh, and uh, like these. Uh, <clears throat> sudden growth, uh, it's something more uh, like seen as a fantastic uh, new modern world. Uh, or uh, if I think of Horizons by <clears throat> Norman McGendis, which is uh, from 1932, again, there is this uh, idea of a, a new incredible uh, aerodynamic uh, airplanes uh, of these uh, like uh, um, nets of uh, highways, uh, and it's what, uh, what we have now, but uh, it was very futuristic at the time. And uh, so in a way, <clears throat> I think that the problem uh, of traffic, yes, was a problem that was solved with uh, highways, um, many highways uh, that now, I mean, the, we found out ourselves in these uh, kind of webs of uh, uh, highways uh, and the traffic is not really solved. So uh, I think that uh, <clears throat> there was a more uh, kind of a positive um, vision for uh, for the future, but uh, um, I was uh, uh, probably uh, Laura also you uh, you saw a a, a, a a gouache in our collection which was called uh, in the a uh, in the age of science and invention by John McCoe. I think you you mentioned it to me also which was very strong because in 1939, uh, the representation of, uh, of, the, of the age of science is uh, like a flooded uh, world. So um, concerns about uh, the, the future were, were still present, were already present in some artists. And uh, then I found also another very uh, strong representation of the flood with the, um, with the from 1949, of uh, like a, a, with a presentation of death in this uh, flood that uh, uh, will uh, destroy our um, like uh, um, like you, houses and uh, and humans. Uh, uh, so I think uh, think uh, think thinking of Florida and uh, the problem of climate change here. High um, so the um, high level. Uh, <clears throat> um, oh my god! Uh, uh, high sea level rise, sorry, uh, sea level rise. I think that these are very um, current uh, for uh, Florida at the, uh, at the moment. But Thank naturally you, there was a, a more uh, optimistic attitude in, uh, in those years, uh, at least in the years before the war. Thank you, Sylvia. Also, and I, I think that at least in the currency of MIT, that, that techno optimism extended in the years past after World War II, yeah. because MIT and other of the research universities and many corporations, at least in America, thought of, you know, they had a lot to celebrate. They, they thought of the heroicism of, of technology. And, and that's, you know, the, the founding of the Center for Advanced Visual Studies at MIT happened in the, 
60s, but it had been going on for a long time and trying to trying to explore the idea of bringing artists and designers, Kepish, who founded the Center for Advanced Visual Studies, really came as a designer to, um, to try to sit beside the, the scientists and the technologists. And I think the program has increasingly taken on a kind of critical role um, as, as as it has um, begun more and more to kind of question at least some unintended consequences and some intended consequences of, of you know, this kind of singular worldview. Thank you, Laura and Sylvia. Um, one question that I, I do have for the panel, anyone can really answer it, is what lessons can we even attendees and all of us can really learn and implement from these featured artists and even illustrations from Ultima with Vasos. What, what do you think would be a lesson that we can all take away from all of this? Nancy, I think you should go first. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, well, I, uh, I, I think, I mean, I, I walk away with this with a, uh, I, I think a lot of gratitude, Laura, for um, the way that, you know, you've kind of organized, um, you know, your thoughts around, uh, you know, the other artists as well that you, you spoke about. Um, it, it's, it makes me feel that there, there is a, and, and here we go with the optimism that you mentioned before, um, which is that there is an emergence of a different kind of consciousness about um, the environment and our, our sort of like ecological, um, th this kind of like ecological consciousness that I think is emerging and is, is um, I hope is not just a, 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 fa a fad, you know, or like kind of a, a temporary thing. And it seems to be something that is becoming um, uh, more and more, I think, uh, part of our daily vocabulary. And I hope that you know, through, you know, I, I don't, I also do not think that art can change the world. I, I think that that is a, also like kind of a counterpart to this techno positivism is also this kind of, you know, cultural academic, you know, positivism. But I also think that there's a way that um, asking questions and engaging with these kind of like, uh, issues in different ways, um, I think is part of contributing to that um, and a discussion, that conversation. Um, but I do think that there's a way in which, you know, action must follow at the same time. And uh, so I think of that this is what I kind of walk away from, uh, from this talk today. The, the really, kind of foundational thinker and a lot of this work was Donna Haraway and um, and you know other especially women philosophers in this field have said things like think we must and I'm you know we're talking today about thinking in other ways thinking in ways that are that are not in the kind of mainstream of western thought um, but the other end point of that, and I think it's an end point that, that Donna Haraway and other thinkers have proposed is, it's not just think we must, it's act we must. Um, so that's the, I, 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 you know, I think today we've been talking about opening up to, to many different forms of knowledge, many different ideas about what intelligence might be as it relates to ecosystemic thinking. Um, and I think that that's, vital um, and I hope that it leads then toward living differently and not just thinking differently. Thank you, Laura. Um, we received a question, an interesting question. Um, as someone who was um, raised, removed from the native culture and um, he or she may be having difficulty shaping the platform in this person situation, um, can any of you offer advice or or view for him or her to begin to explore how they can integrate their art storytelling into their conservation work while remaining culturally respectable? Um, he or she wants to curate and honor these lessons that everyone should embrace 
without seeming as though um, he or she is taking any credit or misrepresenting their identity. I would, I just saw a notice today for a program that the um, Art, Culture and Technology program at MIT is running, I think in April, um, that's being led by Mario Caro, who is talking exactly about these issues um, that, that you're raising. So I would encourage you to, to go to, it's called act.mit.edu um, and look for the Mario Caro program. Um, He's bringing together some really fantastic um, native curators. And I, I think he, that that, I don't have the expertise to speak to it, but Mario does and so do his guests. So, I, you know, I think that could be a really great place to begin. Perfect, thank you, Laura. I have a recommendation oh, yeah. also ahead. for something that might be helpful. Um, I recently came across um, this compendium of writings um, edited by Prudence Gibson and Bailey Britz called Covert Plants, Vegetal Consciousness and Agency in an Anthropocentric World. Um, and this is like a, just kind of like a, generally speaking, and kind of amazing kind of compendium of, of writings by artists, thinkers, researchers, mm -hmm. um, who are trying to deal with like a lot of these kind of similar issues. And I think, um, yeah, it's a, it's a really, it's a great read period and you can get the PDF online um, for free and you could donate to uh, Punctum Books. I could post a, put a link, you know, if, if it helps okay. in, the, in the description, but I really recommend um, just this in general. We're going to be wrapping up, but I just have one quick question to wrap it up. And Nancy, just if you can answer this briefly. Um, I was saying, can you say a little bit more about how you came to work at the Art and Agricultural Center outside of Ramallah? Oh yeah, um, yes. So this this was a part of a. I was taking a course uh, in my master's program, um, and uh, our professor and um, you know really amazing artist Nita Sinekrot was leading a book uh, a class called um, uh, Common Grounds, and so it was part of our sort of like we we all kind of went together on this uh, sort of like a mini artist residency group trip that we took together and then we spent um you know a week there basically sort of responding to the site and um you know to a lot of the thinking that we've been doing around the course um and so that's how you know I came to be in Sakya um for for a sh short period of time perfect thank you Nancy so let's have um Kyle come back on and we'll wrap things up we are wrapping up now. Thank you to our panelists and to all those who joined us today. This webinar recording will be available on our YouTube channel and uh, we will provide you with the link in an email once it becomes available. We encourage you to share uh, this inspiring program with as many people as you can. You will receive a brief survey and we would greatly appreciate your feedback. You will also receive a book list of selected recommendations that can be purchased through Books and Books. Thank you to the Arts and Business Council in Miami and to Books and Books for their continued partnership. Thank you to the Wolfsonian FIU for collaborating with us for this event and to the MIT Alumni Association for their support. This program is sponsored in part by the Department of State Division of Cultural Affairs, the Florida Council of Arts and Culture, and the state of Florida. Everyone take care and be safe. Have a great rest of your weekend. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye.